Uh, hello to all participants and attendees. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today from different parts of the world for all uh, our online activities in the framework of the project GLAM and Digital Soft Power in the Post-Pandemic World. Let me take a few minutes to remind some basic information about the project, as well as share our agenda for today. Our research project explores novel ways to enhance, uh, activate, and communicate the value of cultural heritage in the global media environment to develop meaningful uh, digital cultural relations among GLAM institutions and their audiences um, in different parts of the world. The project employs the power of data and machine learning to develop new technologies and tools for GLAM institutions to better understand assess and demonstrate their impacts in different parts of the world. I'm very happy to invite you to our second online session where we will discuss digital audiences of GLAM institutions. Our webinar today is devoted to a novel topic that hasn't been uh, extensively discussed uh, so far, neither among scholars nor among professionals. We will examine communication risks and challenges existing in the global media environments and explore implications for museums and their work in uh, digital outreach to multilingual and multicultural communities online. The webinar will include three important activities, uh, interactive practitioner panel, interactive data panel, and how-to discussion forum, each taking no longer than 30-40 minutes. We will open the session with an introduction of our host, uh, Professor Cornelio Bioler, the head of the Digital Diplomacy Research Group at the University of Oxford. Um, and we will close the session by discussing practical recommendations and tips on how to address challenges of digital communications offered by our teams of stellar academics and practitioners from around the world. Before we start, I wanted to thank everybody who joined us today and invite you all to use their Q&A function or chat to submit your questions to our panelists and participants. We will try to address them throughout the sessions and also maybe to use some of the discussion forum time to engage closer with all the new issues and ideas that you will bring to the conversation uh, if we have uh, a lot of time for that. Let me now share the floor with the host of the event, Professor Cornelio Biola from the University of Oxford, who is an internationally recognized academic in digital diplomacy and whose uh, contributions uh, significantly advance the knowledge in this field. Cornelio is the author and editor of seven books, including Counting Online Propaganda and Extremism, The Dark Side of Digital Diplomacy, and Digital Diplomacy Theory and Practice, and his most recent publication project is Oxford Handbook on Digital Diplomacy, uh, which is forthcoming in uh, this year. Uh, Professor Biola also has served as a consultant for ministries of foreign affairs across different countries in Europe, Middle East, and Asia. So it is my pleasure to welcome you right now to the floor. Thank you very much, Natalia, for the kind introduction. Uh, I think it was a bit, uh, yeah, uh, quite quite extensive. Um, I mean, this uh, second panel that we started in the, this series is, is quite important because we've seen um, uh, in the context of the evolution of digital technologies that there is a, a sense, especially in the past five years or so, that technology doesn't have only the price side, you know, things that can uh, help um, and uh, be productive and uh, enhance relations of cooperation, but there is also a dark side. Um, we've seen that with social media, but then uh, more recently, there are growing concern about the new, new trends in technology, especially AI, um, uh, um, how, how AI actually could, uh, could um, uh, impede uh, efforts uh, to, to produce or to enhance relations of corporations. So in this context, I think the discussion today is quite important. I think we, what we want to achieve today is to get a clear sense of how a new technologies uh, more in, in, a, in a preemptive uh, kind of, of uh, uh, perspective, uh, to try to understand uh, what are the, the potential uh, uh, vulnerabilities of uh, AI technology and newer technologies, 
uh, for uh, digital uh, diplomacy in general, but also for the relationships that museums and clam institutions will try to project, will try to build uh, with themselves, right? Uh, with the foreign audiences, with audiences in general, but also in relationship in more broader uh, context of diplomatic relations. Um, so pitfalls, uh, potentials for uh, um, uh, manipulation, uh, questions of ethical principles, um, what should we be um, focusing on in terms of understanding um, uh, what kind of rules and norms need to be, uh, to be uh, set right now um, so that we can prevent as much as we can some of the uh, negative implications that may result, especially in relations to GLAM institutions. So uh, um, that's my uh, uh, quick introduction into the topic of the objectives that we hope to accomplish uh, today. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it back to, to Natalia. Thank you so much, Carnelia, for such a thought-provoking introductory talk. And let me now invite Lizzie Longman to the floor. Lizzie is a senior project lead for the network of war collections at the World War II in Amsterdam. And as project manager, she works on digitalizations and opening up and linking data about the Second World War using new digital technologies to facilitate research inform descendants and tell new stories. She's also a board member of Wikimedia uh, Netherlands and Open Data Advocate. So Lizzie will facilitate a discussion with each of our panelists during the first interactive uh, practitioner panel. And along with myself, today we have with us Gray Yor, International Development Consultant for the Australia Council for the Arts in Asia, uh, Karim Ben Khalifa, an award-winning Belgian-Tunisian transdisciplinary artist whose documentary storytelling is at the crossroads of art, science, and technology, and uh, Sheldon Paking, uh, who is a partnership manager uh, with the Science Museum Group, with whom we collaborate very closely on the design of the new prototype to measure museum soft power. So uh, Lizzie, please take it from here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, panelists, and good morning, Natalia. It's so good to see you all um, very early in the morning in Amsterdam, but probably a completely different time in your place. Um, welcome to this very important um, uh, webinar and uh, to discuss um, important questions that have not just affect everyone's daily lives, uh, but also will affect us as museum or GLAM uh, professionals. Um, when we started preparing for this webinar, I was thinking about very famous words of the Dutch Prime Minister just before the Second World War. A uh, myth goes that our Prime Minister in the beginning of May 1940, days before the Germans invaded the Netherlands, said, please all go to bed and sleep well, nothing is going on. And of course, um, time proved that this was fake news because then the Germans were already gathering at the Dutch border. Uh, but what is even more interesting is the fact that the person that these words are so described to was not a prime minister in 1940. His prime ministership ended in 1936. So this is one of the big urban legends in the Netherlands that this prime minister that was not our prime minister uh, stated that we should all sleep and that nothing was going on when he was no prime minister. So for me, um, fake news is something that it is in every time, in every age, everyone has to deal with it. Every new generation has a new way of communication and new ways of communications lead to new versions of fake news. So today, I hope we can hear some samples of fake news that are relevant for us in museums and that may, you know, be more, be part of the time frame we're living in. Um, so please welcome uh, all, and I would like to start with Natalia to give us uh, a few background words this morning. Welcome, Natalia. 
Uh, I'm happy to start the conversation on the panel to give uh, kind of this broader overview of the topic, more from a perspective of an academic observer. And my very brief introductory talk aims to identify specific risks and challenges which museums face in online environments in relation to informational wars and new digital technologies that, if not utilized with peaceful intentions, can significantly disrupt the flow of communication exchange. In the domain of the digital glam, algorithms have the power to shape cultural consumption preferences by serving as information gatekeepers on social networks. The fact that algorithms ensure that online users receive only content which they already favor minimizes the ch chances of cross-cultural exposure to new languages, cultural offerings, and activities. The implications for museums and cultural institutions are that, that their global reach shrinks to populations that have already developed some sort of cultural affinity and familiarization with their content. As a result, social media algorithms reinforce echo chambers and increase the fragmentation of social and political debates online, making it much harder for glam institutions to engage with wider publics, especially targeted groups. Uh, this post-truth global informational environment poses serious challenges to museums who aim to create peaceful bridges across borders for cultural exchanges and heritage sharing. The rapid global spread of COVID-19, for example, also elevated ways of online populist movements, the viral spread of conspiracy theories, and even infodemic. The World Health Organization officially expressed its concerns about the infodemic that was spreading faster than the coronavirus itself, including misinformation, fake news rumors, and overall uncertainty about the whole situation. The World Health Organization recognized vaccine hesitancy as the world's top threat to public health safety particularly in low middle income countries due to the alarming situation regarding anti-vaccine beliefs, myths, and conspiracy theories. And during the crisis, museums around the world installed hundreds of exhibitions devoted to challenging COVID-19 times. Their focus on key topics included uh, recording the impact of the virus on local communities, informing people about the pandemic diseases and viruses, spreading awareness about immunizations against uh, COVID-19, supporting the moral well-being of people in these challenging times. And as you can see also on the screen, uh, museums also served as a vaccination center. So I think Sheldon will continue this conversation offering insights from the Science Museum uh, in London, who toured its uh, super bikes uh, exhibition around the world during these very difficult times. Another important challenge that museums face in the global information environment is algorithmic censorship. For example, algorithms increasingly intervene in the flow of communications of glam institutions by censoring the content that they deem to be inappropriate for public spaces. Algorithms, by contrast to human beings, have a very low capacity to differentiate between the artistic content and historical heritage on the one hand, and hate speech and violence on the other. A public sharing of artifacts representing hardship of wars and genocide become impossible in social media. The Melbourne Holocaust Museum shared that it's, uh, it's a continuous uh, challenges for them to communicate difficult knowledge um, on social media platforms. Uh, and they even hired their own, you know, Lori who constantly co communicate with the platforms in order to publish uh, this difficult content uh, in online environments. So I think Lizzie uh, already shared and can share more details on these uh, issues from the perspective of their Second World War Museum. And also Karim, who is also on the panel, might elaborate further on the challenges of the use of uh, virtual reality to communicate difficult knowledge to bring viewers face to face with their soldiers from conflict zones. Another interesting case about censoring museum content online is blocking nude art that Austrian museums attempted to share on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, the Vienna Natural History Museum was very disappointed that its famous statue of Venus was banned from Facebook because of nudity. 
After many similar cases happening with museums in Vienna, the City Tourism Board established a different approach through Vienna Late Bear campaign, and the board decided to promote museums' art on OnlyFans, a subscription-based website mostly closely associated with sex work. Uh, subscribers to the Tourism Board page can check out explicit works held at four uh, of the Austrian famous museums. While artificial intelligence censorship challenges museums to share the content online, one cannot deny its efficiency uh, uh, to work with large corpora of cultural data that can be utilized to share cultural heritage in completely new ways. For example, artificial intelligence enabled applications that digitally resurrect historical figures based on the archival material and footage um, uh, that, that enables a communication not only across space and culture, but across time. Deep fakes of historical figures could engage with visitors with, um, on a completely new emotional level. However, the main problem is that when deep fakes are made without consent of individuals, but is an impossible task when we deal with uh, people who lived in the past. The Dali Museum in the United States, for instance, developed a deep fake of the greatest master of surrealism who can interact with visitors to share their, uh, his uh, own life and works. However, deep fakes of historical figures, no matter how accurate they could be, are still a subject of artificial intelligence by us. The digitally reconstructed Dali is an algorithmic aggregate of the uh, sum total of the painter's celebrity image shaped by the long-standing commercialization and commodification of his image on the global scale. In the academic scholarship, there was a concern raised about the acquisition of creative deep uh, fakes by museums as a legitimizing force of this technology. Deep fakes could offer museums exciting opportunities to engage people across borders. But the question remains, if machines can deliver the same depth meaning quality and integrity of communications as human beings. Uh, in this post-truth informational environment, the educational role of GLAM institutions is highly important. And cultural organizations not only need to be aware, <laughs> but effectively address multiple concerns and strategically design uh, inclusive and safe online spaces. I'm sure that other participants on the panel uh, will have um, share more deeper insights and specific examples illustrating how exactly uh, their own institutions address these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for this great introduction. Um, you already mentioned three or four different forms of fake uh, news and miscommunication that we as GLAM institutions have to deal with, uh, ranging from fragmentation, exclusion, uh, inappropriate content, ex or things marked as inappropriate, and deep fake. Um, I hope we will learn a bit more about um, all of these issues um, uh, in a COVID-19 context. So I would now like to give the floor to Gray Yo, who will talk a bit about uh, the COVID situation and the influence of the pandemic. Floor is to you, Gray. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Natalia. Um, I, my presentation, I think, will kind of take a step back um, out of the intricacies and details and really look at some of the challenges uh, in the digital and in the arts in Asia. Um, but I first want to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone as well. And thank you for having me. Um, firstly, it's also customary a little bit in Australia to begin meetings with an acknowledgement to country. So I want to take this opportunity to start off by acknowledging the country and the land that we all gathered on and dialing in from today. Um, I'd like to pay my deepest respects to First Nations and Indigenous elders and peoples from around the world, and some of them who may be joining us today or watching the recording. Um, just very quickly, I think um, as an introduction, I wanted to give a little bit uh, uh, background to myself. I've been working in the arts all my life, um, and majority of it is based in Southeast Asia. I'm also a producer um, of um, 
producer, arts administrator, a policy researcher, and sometimes designer. So my the caveat of this presentation is to say that the sharing is really based on my observations, stem from my personal and professional like uh, working experience. Um, and also when I say Asia, I often do mean East Asia and South Asia, not so much including um, Central and West Asia, which is not somewhere I'm familiar with. I also like using data to showcase some of uh, my findings and I use uh, ourworldindata.org a lot. Um, and also I like to say that Asia as a region uh, is as diverse as it gets. It's virtually impossible for one person to capture everything in one presentation. So I hope that you'll forgive me if I missed out some things. Um, not wanting to waste time, we won't be discussing a lot about Asia and its geopolitics, its inequalities and all that. Um, which of course have com has been compounded by the effects of the COVID pandemic over the past two years. Um, safe to say that the pandemic has not been a great equalizer, but in fact, it has been a great revealer. And it reveals to us how much some countries are not prepared for a global pandemic. And a sector, especially the arts and the glam sector, was in some countries almost completely devastated. Um, many governments set up support systems for them, the organization I work for, the Australia Council for the Arts, for example, released a set of recovery measures um, and recovery grants, helping artists to pivot to digital. And this is where I think we will focus a little bit on the discussion about the digital as well. As positive and seemingly life-saving digital technology was seen to the artists and arts making community, it's not really all that rosy. Uh, the fact is, up to 2014 and 2019, if you look back, more than half of the population in Asia still do not have access to the internet, and more than half of the countries in Asia do not have fast-speed internet infrastructure like broadband or high-speed mobile data technology. So the pivot to digital by the arts industry is one that is already quite precarious pre-pandemic and needed a lot of preparation. And the quick adoption of digital technology in the past two years, it's akin to throwing the artists into the deep end of the pool and expecting them to paint, dance, sing, and act while trying to make a flotation device out of straws and balloons all at the same time. Pivoting to digital is just not that easy. The artists face a lot of different challenges from my observations. You know, they found themselves having to learn how to use digital technology very quickly in a matter of weeks or months. They need to learn how to do live streaming, how to record, record good quality audio, how to make the best TikTok and you know, Snapchat videos. And as what Lizzie and Natalia have said earlier, making sure that those informations are accurate and not you know, being hijacked um, by other people. Not only that, you know, visual artists needed to learn how to sell their works online. Um, they needed to learn how to do virtual studio visits. Um, it's something that they've never done before. Um, not only that, artists had had to learn how to collaborate with each other over the internet, and also sometimes to undertake digital residencies while being stuck at home. So venues and platforms very, um, needed to retrofit very quickly to enable themselves to deliver the content to the digital audiences. Um, you know, some venues and platforms have decided to go online um, using virtual worlds like metaverses, um, using digital avatars to represent their physical self of the artist. Um, we saw adoptions of Mozilla hubs, for example, um, by art markets and, and virtual museums. So artists find themselves finding the challenge of actually designing and creating new experiences that is not only accessible, but also truthful and factual to their audiences who are stuck at home. And speaking of audiences, they too also have um, barriers to overcome in this digital pivot. My earlier slide shows that the access to the internet in Asia is still not at the ideal rate. Some countries like Myanmar and Laos still have out-of-date infrastructures and cannot support the huge amount of data required for artists to deliver quality of work that they want online. And of course, not to mention the issues and the concerns around freedom of information and expression, and also the censorship and control that artists are facing in these countries. Not only that they are not able to get um, their work out there without being censored, they can't even talk to their peers or show people around the world what they're facing back home. 
Also, the online viewing habit and engagement of audiences differ very greatly from doing watching things at home versus in the venue. Yeah. So with multiple screens, you know, people are uh, having shorter attention span more than ever right now. So sometimes, you know, they are watching multiple things on multiple screens, and then the digital fatigue really sets in. As vaccination rates across countries in Asia continue to rise and rec the recovery rate of countries vary tremendously. Some countries have opened up, some of the art venues still have limits of visitors and um, audiences, and some are still taking small steps in order to see how they can carefully welcome people back. Some are still going on the digital and hybrid mode. And in some countries in Asia also, there are still forms of border control and restrictions. It means that artists still cannot fully travel and still cannot fully collaborate with their, their peers. So we wanted to see how you know, some artists are still thinking about new ways or like hybrid ways of working with their peers and their audiences. We need to also realize that the recovery rate is not similar and not uniform. Some countries can already travel, others artists still cannot. So that is very much in the question at this point. And finally, I wanted to share that, you know, even though we are going digitally and we're talking about it not being simple, um, there is a lot of positive and opportunities there. Um, digital technology can enable people to really think about access, uh, creating equal access to um, everyone using uh, closed captioning, using subtitling, using sign language, for example. While some are encumbered by limitations posed by digital technology, um, others are empowered by it. So a good example that I watched was this show called Who's There, where the actors from six different um, bedrooms in four different cities acted using Zoom as their platform. And the co-director of this show said that he will not be held, by, uh, held ransom by the pandemic from making art. So the pandemic and the digital technology offer a glimpse into what the future of arts and artists is like for us. And I think you know, a lot of people are starting to think about concept touring um, while they're discussing distribution of their work online. You know, virtual uh, visual artists are talking about exploring NFTs, for example. So granted, these ideas are not new. I believe that due to the pandemic and the mass and forced adoption of digital technology, among the other things that we will discuss today, um, the art sector and the community are eager to march and embrace ahead uh, with digital technology as our future. I'll stop there. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank, thank you, Gray, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I love the fact that you start with thanking your land and your elders. I, I really will take this with me for next presentations. That is such a beautiful tradition. Um, so you, you showed us examples of artists creating a new digital realm to be active, even though they are in lockdown. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, is there still a role for museums or glam institutions in this world? Or are we, as museums, are we the television in a streaming service era? Or did we miss uh, out on this new digital uh, exploration or art? Or are museums still part of it? Could you elaborate on that? Sure. I think um, museums are still very much part of it. You know, the design or the experience for an uh, audience or a visitor, a digital visitor, a virtual visitor into a virtual museum is very different. Um, I know from an observation that I had during the pandemic was museums in Asia were really doing a lot of virtual galleries. And while they are doing that, the end goal of this virtual gallery was very clear. It's not to replace a physical museum, but it's often a way to entice new visitors for them to kind of see what's going on, look at the artwork digitally, and if possible, explore a little bit of the interactivity that is offered by digital museums, and then entice them to go and see the actual thing in the physical museum now that things are opening up again. So I believe that in the future as well, um, it's not going to be um, ending once the pandemic is over, but it's going to continue. Uh, and do you think we used these two last years enough to experiment and to find new uh, ways of communication or could we have done more? 
I think, um, again, based on my observations, more could have been done, but I'm not sure whether how that also was limited by the technology that we have. Um, you know, adoption of these type of technologies are not cheap and also it's not easy. So museums, I'm sure Sheldon will be able to share with us later, they are also learning at the, as, as much as they go on with this new technology. So we saw um, certainly museums adopting technology, but they're also playing with it. I'm not sure if the pandemic gave, gave them enough time to actually experiment and come up with something new. Of course, we all do not want the pandemic to be prolonged. Um, but I do think that you know, the experimentation will not end. I think it's a great start. And also one thing I would say is that this opportunity actually opens up accessibility to people who may not be able to visit museums for whatever reasons, whether they have disabilities or whether they live out of um, the city. It takes a longer time for them to get into the museum physically. So virtual museums in the, is one way providing access to people like that. Thank you for mentioning these uh, benefits from this uh, pandemic era uh, for museums. And thank you for bridging uh, to Sheldon. Um, Superbug, I'm so fascinated just by the name of the exhibition that was then, um, you know, uh, uh, came, ran into a real pandemic and into a real superbug. So Sheldon, please, can you tell us a bit about your exhibition and your experiences in, with the exhibition during a pandemic? Um, sure, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheldon and I'm the, uh, I work as a partnerships manager at the National Science Museum in uh, London and its sister museums across the country. And as partnerships manager, my job is for the most part to adapt exhibitions that tour internationally so that they can be received properly by communities around the world um, and in regions that might be particularly susceptible to censorship and active misinformation campaigns. Um, so we do a lot of negotiating around um, censorship and, and misinformation um, throughout our work. So I've kind of compiled uh, learning points that we've picked up over the last few years, um, especially with our, our last project, uh, Superbugs, uh, which toured through uh, 19 countries uh, on four continents, uh, sorry, 19 venues across four continents. Um, and uh, yeah, it had great success, which we're very happy with. Um, but this is an exhibition about antibiotic resistance. So it's about the, the downfall of institutionalized medicine um, that happened to launch in 2019, which happened to be just absolutely terrible timing. Uh, not to mention the fact that uh, we tried to open in February of 2020 in Wuhan itself. So we had some awful timing and things didn't quite go to plan. Um, but it meant that we learned a lot about how uh, how to negotiate these kinds of areas where we're talking about particularly sensitive subject matter, where there's going to be active censorship and misinformation floating around everywhere. Now, one of the big things that we really push with these touring exhibitions is that as we develop uh, new content that we really try to fly under the radar, um, the more you're under the radar, the easier it is to just get everything done. Um, so to that extent, uh, we recommend very highly of uh, working with a local partner. Um, by working with local partners, you can activate their own networks that allow you to collect content without having to do any cold calls and potentially draw a lot of unneeded profile to yourself. Um, and when choosing a partner, um, it's again this balance of how high of a profile you want to be taking on um, versus still getting that audience. So what we've found is that uh, if you go to the big nationals, you draw a, a, a big attention, a, a big eye. Um, but if you only go for smaller institutions like local um, organizations, then you don't get the audience that you really hope for um, with an international touring exhibition. Um, so we've taken to partnering up with a regional um, institutions. And that gives us a really nice balance of not having the, the scrutiny of being at a national institution while at the same time capturing the audience that we would uh, from something more than a, a smaller institution. Um, we also, uh, the big thing that we do is we, we do everything we can in order to build trust. This is one of those things where the more you invest in it, the more you get out of it. Um, when we're working with our partner venues, especially in areas where there's intense areas of censorship and misinformation, they're putting themselves on the line by partnering up and by uh, 
hosting an exhibition. So it's really quite important to invest in that relationship, uh, which can take a lot of time and a lot of money in order to do. Um, and by money, I don't mean giving money. I mean, uh, making sure that there's a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, um, ensuring that there is a prolonged investment between the two organizations and that you're really serious about a project and that um, you're in it together. Um, we do have an article in the journal Exhibition um, that was written using Superbugs as a case study with how we choose and work with our partners back in spring of of 2021. So if you're interested in that copy, um, it's great. And I can also send you um, a copy of that article myself if you're interested. Um, so aside from choosing your partners, uh, the other big thing is really knowing your audience. Um, and this isn't just about knowing who is coming um, as we typically look at in museums, but in areas that have intense censorship and misinformation, it's also important to know how effective local misinformation campaigns have already been. Um, and really critically to know what kind of authority visitors already see museums as having in that area. So, uh, very often we find that museums are seen as having a high authority and actually have enough um, intellectual authority to challenge um, the official government uh, stance on certain ideas um, and other kinds of misinformation that they hear from their from people's friends, um, which is fantastic. Um, but that's not always the case. So it's really good to know where your visitors are actually coming from, where what they already understand, um, and, uh, and 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 what how they see the museum field itself in order to speak to them properly. It's also really important to start with common ground. So if you're really too affronting with the content, um, if your if your exhibition opens with everything you thought you know about this thing is wrong, um, you'll just have a lot of disengagement. So it's really quite important for us to start with what can we all agree on, um, and where where do we all. Uh, where, where, where do we start from really? And then for us not to push too hard, um, the, the, the harder you push, the quicker you lose people. And I think it's really important to be realistic with expectations of visitors. People don't go to museums to have their minds changed. Um, they go um, and if you're lucky, um, they'll have conversations with their friends and families. They'll have uh, an extra chat with the people that they're there with. Um, they might reach out to peers after they go home or look something up on their own. And that's really what the aim is. It's not, it, the, the museum sector shouldn't just be used as a different form of propaganda messaging. And that's really quite important uh, when trying to address your audience. And finally, uh, when there is opportunity for nuance, a static display does not play well to nuance. Um, so when there are these complicated, sensitive subjects, we really recommend uh, that you save a lot of those kinds of, that, uh, those that kind of interaction for a dialogue, so like an event series, um, or the opportunity for people to engage directly with experts. Um, we've just found that this is the easiest way in order to talk about really nuanced kind of conversation and get around a lot of the uh, the intense censorship and misinformation that we see in some of the areas that we've launched in the past. And my third top tip uh, is to have in any exhibition modular content and design. So. In any exhibition, you'd expect a good 20 to 30 percent of the content that you really want in an exhibition to land up in the cutting room floor. But this is especially true when you're dealing with an area that has intense censorship uh, in place. So uh, basically, uh, I'd recommend not be, to be too dear with any of your content. Uh, be ready to have anything cut out if need be. Um, it's better to have 80% of the narrative that you're really passionate about than to have none of it because it's not telling the whole story anymore. Um, so uh, being able to tell that story might involve having a lot of backup content, but also to have modular uh, design built into everything. Make it so that you can cut things out and it doesn't inter it doesn't uh, destroy the overall narrative of an exhibition um, or mm -hmm. disrupt the design. Um, and then finally, uh, be ready to move on quickly. Um, we're not looking to, to, again, we're not looking to change minds and, and change the world with an exhibition, but what we can do is inspire conversation. Um, so if something is cut, um, acknowledge that and move on and don't dwell too much on it. Um, so that's it. Those are my three, uh, those are my three ideas on, on how you can launch an exhibition in an area that might be highly subject to censorship and misinformation. Oh, thank you so much for this very practical and also very interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, I know a lot of museums in the Netherlands and probably in Europe are looking into new ways, even more activist ways to um, 
get a bigger audience engaged to be become more diverse um, more plural form in conversations um, and what you're actually saying is that we may go way too far in this need to be a more activist or a more um, diverse uh, uh, place. Um, are you, is this, uh, in your opinion, the same situation in Europe? Should we take it more slowly or do you think there's a difference here? I think there's a difference when looking at just diversity of, of visitors. Um, I think when it comes to attracting everyone within all kinds of communities is fantastic for any museum, which is essentially a, 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 a community space. I think it's fantastic for them to be as diverse as possible. Um, but I think when it comes to um, doing international exhibitions, especially when um, the people visiting might be um, might have been exposed to a lot of misinformation, um, might have only be seeing very specific kinds of information um, to really push and to really go and push the boundaries um, is more often than not too much. Um, and that we should be really realistic with how we see touring exhibitions specifically reaching audiences. Um, and mm -hmm. we don't we don't look at um, touring exhibitions as an opportunity to to have our own version of propaganda to fight the the other propaganda yeah. that's in place. Yeah, I suppose okay. that that's what I feel about diversity. Yeah. Okay, so you're using your local partners also as a, a, a check to know when you're pushing the boundaries or where the dialogue can happen and where it's it's getting complicated. Is that the big role of your partners? Yeah, that's one of the roles of our partners. Uh, we've found that having local partners is just so, it, it is so critical in order for a basic sense check. Um, as well, there are, there, it's so easy to put your foot in your mouth because uh, you're putting an exhibition together about culturally sensitive subjects and you don't wanna be using the wrong kind of wording even um, that might be, uh, that might give the wrong message. So it's really, really quite critical to have uh, those those partners on side in order to just give a, a really basic sense check all the way through and they'll understand their visitors better than you do although we do recommend um, everywhere to have an independent um, exhibition um, audience evaluation uh, just because uh, we've found that with uh, with any museum, um, they're going to be an expert in a very specific field, and a touring exhibition is by definition brought in because it doesn't cover what the museum already does. Um, so it's just uh, getting that extra specificity will really help, especially when there's censorship in place. Well, thank you for this great presentation. I would like to invite Sheldon and Ray uh, to join me in the conversation uh, about um, the topic of this morning, which of course is uh, disinformation, propaganda, and the role museums play in it. Um, and I was wondering, uh, we already heard Sheldon uh, mention a couple of things we as a museum uh, can do. Uh, I would also like to invite Gray to reflect on the role of artists in this conversation. What could they do to uh, open uh, a more open dialogue and uh, stop this information from spreading. Um, sure. Um, thanks, Lizzie. I think um, similar to what Sheldon has said as well, I think a lot of it is about building trusts, um, whether it's trusts between the artists and the community, the museum and the artists, the museum and its audiences, its partners to understand audiences. I think trust is the most important thing. And based on the topic as well, you know, in a kind of like post-truth fake news, um, we are all essentially talking about the deficit in trusts, you know, the relationship between people and how do you rebuild or you regain those trusts. Um, I think as artists um, progress and in this um, kind of post-pandemic, well, post in inverted commas, because we are still going through a pandemic, um, there's a lot of discussions to be had. There's a lot more nuanced conversations that needs to be had, um, especially between artists and the institutions that want to work with them or present their work. Um, I think a lot of listening, um, you know, deep listening that needs to be had. Um, and I'm sure that goes both ways as well. So I think in my, in my opinion, um, really, it's, it's really about um, going a little bit slowly and you know often in the glam sector or in the art sector time is not our friend 
Um, you know, we have deadlines. We, we are often chasing after certain things, certain um, pressures from opening an exhibition or to, you know, completing an artwork. But actually we found that, you know, the longer artists have conversations with, um, with their partners, with their peers, maybe their collaborators, with their presenters, uh, the more, you know, trust is built, the more conversations and new ones can be had, um, and the clarity will come across, I feel. So I feel that, you know, again, coming back to um, the trust deficit um, and a lot of active, you know, um, bad players out there wanting to sow distrust, that's something that we can do, perhaps, to, to kind of counter that measure. So um, um, we already heard um, that from your presentation and from Sheldon's presentation that there's a big difference between uh, a glam institutions in some countries versus glam institutions in other countries. Uh, in some countries, they were supported by government. In some countries, they just struggled. Um, I guess the same goes for artists. Do you think uh, the, the pandemic broadened the gap between glam institutions and artists, or did they? Is it a place where they can come together? Um, and how does does government support play into this? Um, so, do you, as maybe is a big question, my first question would be, um, do you think uh, museums and artists were able to find each other and do the same thing? Or has the pandemic broadened the gap between artists and institutions? It's, um, it's a tricky question because I, I kind of see a bit of both. You know, I see like um, uh, glam sector museum institutions really wanting to support artists during this difficult time. Um, and certainly with the support of government as well, not just, um, you know, in my experience, the Australian government or the Singaporean government, or indeed the Malaysian government, but a lot of um, these type of government agencies are helping out with the artists and through sometimes through the institutions themselves. Um, it is a tricky one because sometimes I feel that institutions also have their own um, objectives and also board of directors perhaps to answer to. Um, they have their own income targets, they have their own visitorship targets, and that's also based on my experience working in an institution before. And sometimes these type of targets, um, they, they come ahead with another, with the artists and what they want to do, and especially during a difficult time and challenging time. Um, so I think that's a bit of both. Um, I think it will always be a constant, um, almost like an argument or a constant one up each other that I sometimes feel that it's quite healthy, where you're pushing some, some kind of envelope. Um, but more importantly, you are also giving an artist, well, the arts community, the arts making community, something that they want to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think support is really, really important for the art sector as a whole. And, and Sheldon, uh, when uh, you worked with uh, people trying to um, uh, present information about the superbugs and about medicine, etc., in an era of COVID, uh, did you feel that people coming from the, the, the um, um, medical sciences and glam institutions were able to collaborate and um, show um, a, a less uh, misinformed uh, story about superbugs? Yeah, I think we found a lot of support within the medical community. Um, what's really fantastic about um, the museum field is that when, especially in a science museum kind of a kind of a realm, is that when we reach out to uh, at more academic fields of of work, um, that we get very enthusiastic response back. Um, so we do have really really fantastic support um, from the medical fields in areas that we have opened, but we do get. Uh, the more the more we reach out, the more we get pushed back naturally uh, from local governments. Um, so there there was there was a point um, where uh, I did have to meet someone in an embassy because of an anti surveillance technology um, oh within a God. specific meeting room. I had to be searched the whole way down to make sure I had no recording equipment. I was handed a little stack of documents and was told, "We've never met. Good luck on your exhibition. You've never heard of me. Never contact me again." <laughs> 
Um, so there well, is a little bit of cloak and dagger at times, but it does mean um, that you do have that um, almost unequivocal support um, from, more, from more academic fields when you're coming at it from an academic perspective. Okay, so I can imagine that suddenly as a, a glam professional, you ended up in this James Bond-like world. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the nature of the game when uh, you're dealing with such politically sensitive subjects is that um, when you're working with some content contributors, they're often putting their careers on the line um, to make sure mm -hmm. that specific stories are told. Um, it, it feels a little bit strange to be going into that from a museum sector, where yeah. especially in a country like the UK, where we do not associate museums with censorship and drawing political attention like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's a little bit strange, but um, it's something that uh, that's really quite important for us to to pursue in order to to tell the right story. Yeah, I in the during the pandemic, a lot of scientists in the Netherlands were threatened. So they even got stickers on the door saying here lives an enemy of, you know, the people or whatever. Um, I, I was really surprised by the, um, the, the amount of anger that was channeled towards people that, that you know, are scientists or artists or um, any intellectual uh, labor. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any idea why these groups are specifically targeted during the pandemic? What, what, what made, well, why I think did this happen, you think? A big part of this touches in with uh, what Gray was mentioning as well, this idea of a disconnection of trust. And as we enter a pandemic dominated world, um, we are putting more and more trust in our in, in our medical professionals. Um, so uh, because so much trust is put in them, if there's any inkling of doubt, um, then it mm -hmm. manifests in resistance and anger. Um, but that's that's just my experience. Yeah. Um, well, I'm afraid time is up for this uh, this session, which is really sad because I, I I would still like to learn a lot more about the role of museums and how we can at least try and dis channel or mis channel or you know uh, stop uh, all this anger and frustration toward thing that can actually cure the world, but. <laughs> Um, I don't think we can save the planet in 40 minutes on a Monday morning, uh, but I do hope that the next panel will give it a go and make a better world for all of us. I would really love to thank uh, Geo and Sheldon uh, uh, for this wonderful uh, contribution this morning. Thank you for your information and your experiences and sharing it with us. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lizzie, for facilitating so brilliantly this panel. I also must acknowledge that it was a real challenge to solicit <laughs> contribution to this panel. It was difficult to find speakers who would, uh, you know, talk about this very sensitive topic from their own institutional perspectives. And I'm very, uh, you know, grateful that we have Sheldon and uh, Gray with us today to share their perspectives, you know, complementing my kind of academic observational viewpoint, which is more theoretical, and we really need, you know, to, to hear real stories uh, uh, happening uh, in the reality. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And let me now move to the second interactive panel, uh, which will discuss critical issues around da data privacy, ethics, provenance and equity, data access and censorship. It's my pleasure to give the floor back to Cornelio, who will, will facilitate the panel. Uh, today on the panel, we have Jamila Jordan, business systems analyst at the Ministry of Justice in New Zealand, uh, who has participated in numerous uh, really amazing data visualization projects for arts organizations. Katarina Holm, director of research at Diplo Foundation, and uh, Raluca Sernatoni, a, a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe, where she works on European security and defense with a specific focus on disruptive technologies. So the floor is yours, Carnelo. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, many thanks, you know, to the panelists from the, from the first uh, section. Um, 
uh, Lizzie uh, Sheldon and Gray, I, I, I followed your your presentation with great interest. And it's a pity that we didn't have time to more time to discuss, you know, some of the conclusions that you have, have reached. Moving now to the second part. The second part is more about with AI and so on, but also with VR um, uh, rising. I think it's important to take note of of new challenges, but also prob uh, probably opportunities. Let me start with an example. I'm going to put a link here in the chat room. In the chat room, uh, the link refers to uh, an article in The Guardian, uh, which was published in 2020 in September. And why is this article important? Because it's the first op-ed ever written by an AI entity. Uh, so if you go to the link, for instance, we're going to see that you know the, the particular entity was the famous uh, GP3, the open eye language generator, which is part of um, uh, Elon Musk Foundation. Um, so what is important about this uh, this article is that if you follow and you read it, it's uh, it tells us a, uh, tell us a, a, an interesting story. Uh, uh, the, the 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 entity tries to convince you know uh, the reader that it's not here to harm the people, but when you try to unpack the whole concept. Many of the issues that we try to discuss in the second panel uh, come up. Uh, first of all, uh, what kind of data or you know resources have been used to create you know the op-ed? Uh, and I think that uh, touches on question of inclusivity or equality, uh, and uh, uh, that's 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 an important aspect that we have to think of, uh, into account. What kind of cultural resources you put into an algorithm? In order to make it uh, uh, interesting, but also in a in a sense relevant, uh, there is a second aspect which you have to take into account: is how this data is being aggregated to produce certain um, outputs. I remember when Twitter has come along. Um, Twitter, all these platforms come with uh, more subtle cultural um, uh, influences. I remember Twitter come about uh, the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, has refrained from tweeting in German for a long time because German uh, words are pretty long. So they established a Twitter uh, account when Twitter expanded from 180 characters, 140 characters, 280 characters. So I think it's also interesting in terms of, you know, the more less visible nuances that we've seen in the way in which data is being aggregated. And probably we have to take a look at that as well. And the third point, which I think it uh, comes out from this article, from this op-ed written by uh, GP3, GPT-3, is, is uh, what happens as a result? How do we interpret the role of AI in our society, especially in the context of cultural institutions? So we've witnessed you know, some interesting presentations about how cultural institutions adapted to the pandemic in the first part. Um, uh, Sheldon um, and also Gray, what will that mean for us in the future? Will uh, the work of Sheldon and Gray be replaced by a uh, future in GPT-3 type of, of, of entity in which a lot of activities will be created by AI? Uh, are we ready to accept this? Uh, what will be the pitfalls? What will be the challenges of uh, integrating, right, in the work of cultural institutions, uh, this new uh, 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 type of, of um, uh, cultural actors? I think these are some of the questions that I thought might be interesting you know, to preface, to uh, introduce um, uh, before I give the floor to our brilliant uh, uh, panelists today, uh, Jamila Jordan, who is a business analyst at the Ministry of uh, uh, New Zealand, Katharina Hong, Director of the Research at Diplo Foundation, as well as uh, Raluca Cernatoni, Visiting Scholar at Carnegie uh, Europe. We'll follow the same format, but also I'd like you to encourage something. Um, so uh, while we're listening to the presentation, please in the chat room in case you have comments or questions for the panelists. So then, you know, I can uh, keep an eye on them and maybe, you know, during the Q&A uh, after each presentation, I can bring some of your thoughts um, into the discussion as well. So that being said, let me turn first to Jamila. Uh, uh, Jamila, you have uh, five, seven, seven minutes, you know, to, to introduce the topic. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Yeah. Um, Cornelia, thank you so much um, for bringing up that article. I think it ties in really well with my, what my presentation will be on, and that is um, data analysis and being aware of 
using it for equity and being aware of biases that can sneak in. Um, before I go into that, I just want to introduce myself. So my name is Jamila Jordan. I'm currently in New Zealand. Um, I'm an analyst with the Ministry of Justice, but my talk today is going to be focused on a project I did a few years ago when I was at Carnegie Mellon University studying for my master's in arts management, their data analytics track. I did feel this project would be a bit more appropriate for this conference, given that we are in the glam sector. Um, so my presentation is twofold. First, I want to give a high-level overview of the project. Um, the project that I did was to test a hypothesis on inequitable access to the arts due to public transit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is a city in the USA. Second, I'm going to present it in the framework of the data lifecycle, which is a really useful approach for any data analysis project. So the data lifecycle is described differently depending on the source. The definition that I like and that I'll be using is from a group called the Urban Institute. I hope that um, after this short presentation, you all have are left with ideas for how you can analyze arts equity by using your data and sourcing outside data. And also that you're left with the understanding that data is not neutral. There are entry points for bias throughout the life cycle. And when we're aware of them, we can be better prepared to mitigate them. This this is, again, a short overview. If anyone's interested in discussing um, anything in length, I'm more than happy to connect. So without further ado, as I mentioned, the impetus for this project um, stemmed from me finding out that Black and low-income populations in Pittsburgh had very low participation rates in the arts and culture sector. Just as we're always collecting data on our visitors, it is important to know who's in our audience, who's not coming, and why. I lived in Pittsburgh at the time and relied on public transit, which was pretty spotty. So I wondered if that had something to do with the issue. Um, the first step to starting the project was data acquisition, stage one of the data life cycle, which deals with data collection and data sourcing. I first looked at whether I needed to collect primary data or if existing data would suffice. Constantly seeking primary data, especially from underserved communities, um, groups can be fatiguing for those involved. There's a really great resource called Why Am I Always Being Researched, which guides on disrupting power dynamics of data collection. If it turns out you do need to collect data, be aware that primary data collection processes are ripe for bias. And so it's important to examine um, all of these processes with a critical eye. Luckily for me, this project didn't require any primary data collection. I sourced from secondary sources. So I downloaded demographic data from the census, transit data from the state government website, and attendance data from a quality of life survey that was administered by the University of Pittsburgh. For the survey, I did go through and inspect their methodology and survey instruments to understand the resulting data sets, its biases, and limitations. I was able to do this because the University of Pittsburgh published the methodology alongside the data set. So that is best practice so that someone who's using it can go through um, and see how it was aggregated. I got a list of arts and culture organizations in Pittsburgh from an organization called SMU Data Arts. It's a great resource for anyone, of, anyone who might be participating who's in the US. Um, they, they have a lot of resources on arts related data. Um, for the United States. So this data set that I got from them was a selection licensed only for use in this project. So I moved to stage two, which was the processing and analysis. Um, this deals with how you create meaning from data. I wanna point out that the same data may be interpreted differently by different analysts and the results can still be perfectly correct based on the techniques they used. So it's best practice to keep a process log um, if you are doing a data analysis project or doing anything related to data analysis so that anyone can review the techniques. Since my question was centered on spatial data, I used a program called ArcGIS. It's a tool for geospatial analysis. I started by mapping the variables of interest. So I mapped Pittsburgh neighborhood, which is shown here, by black population, which is the map on the left, showing higher black population in blue and income, which is the map on the right, showing lower income in orange and then red. 
Notice that where you see the blue on the left map here, you're seeing a lot of the same areas highlighted in the low income map. So it seems the two variables are correlated. And I ran a regression analysis, which shows that there is a negative correlation between the two. The higher the black population, the lower the median income. I then mapped the location of the arts and culture organizations. See that there's a lot clustered here um, in the center, which is Pittsburgh's cultural district. And I also mapped their transit, their public transit network. So some of the network does pass outside of the city, um, but this was not used for the analysis. The analysis only looked at the network within the city limits. Um, so for I took the transit network layer and compared it to the arts organization layer to create the service area layer. So this shows travel time to any of the arts organizations. You could see that the green are places within are areas or neighborhoods that are served within 10, zero to 10 minutes of any arts organization by public transit. And the colors progress to show an increase in travel time. I did, right, so my initial question asked if black and or low income areas are negatively impacted by lack of public transit access. And I found that in general, um, majority low income or majority black neighborhoods are not far from arts and culture organizations by public transit, which does suggest that the low attendance from these groups is not the result of public transit access, as I initially hypothesized. So the reason they're not coming could be attributed to something else. Are they not interested in the exhibitions? Um, timing of the ex exhibitions could be prohibitively inconvenient. We already know that black and low income groups are correlated, as, so there might be an affordability issue. All of these are hypotheses that could be further investigated um, and could be the start of another data analysis project. Um, the, so the third stage of the life cycle is dissemination, which is how you distribute your findings. Data and analyses should be accessible. If you've collected information from a community, they should be provided access and it should be ensured that they are aware of how to find and access um, the data. In this case, I shared findings with SMU Data Arts. Um, so it's published in their uh, site and it's also published to my online portfolio. This was a very small project. If you do a larger project in your organization, the dissemination process will be a lot more comprehensive. And the fourth stage is disposition, which deals with how you archive or get rid of your data. So it's called the life cycle because this stage ties back into the acquisition stage. Often when we're sourcing secondary data, we'll look into how other organizations, and where other organizations have stored their data. Um, disposition, get, actually getting rid of the data would link to your organization's governance policy. So I hope this presentation has stimulated some new ideas for you all. I do want to end with the reminder that data is not neutral. A good way to break up any data project um, that is undertaken is by using the data lifecycle to help examine for bias at every stage. I've quickly gone over some best practices, but these resources I've listed here are a great place to get more in-depth information. Um, have them here in case you want to take a screenshot. Jamila, thank you very much for the for the presentation. Very interesting findings, um, and I think the the project has a broader implications, ramification for the um, um, ideas that we discussed today. May I press you a little bit more on the data um, selection uh, part? Uh, I've been wondering um, what kind of data have you looked at? Uh, how easy it was for you to access them? Uh, to what extent, how do you assess, you know, exactly what you said, the neutrality of data? How do you define data neutrality in this particular case? Um, uh, just uh, maybe, you know, you can elaborate a little bit more. I think, you know, it has relevance, broader relevance for the, uh, for the topics on the, on the discussion today. For sure. Um, so when I initially started looking at the data, um, that I would need, I honed in on the purpose of my question, um, which was to find out 
where, which was to find out if the public transit access um, affected attendance of black or um, and low income populations. And so a lot of the data that I need, I was, I was already aware that it, it was available without going to people to try to find it. Um, some of the data, for example, the census, which I am in New Zealand and we have the census here, that's also open source. Um, many governments will provide that. So the census data will provide basic demographic information on who is located where. Um, and the data for the transit network was also open source. It was open, it was free for download by the, um, by the state government. The, the data that I thought I might have had to go out and search for by asking people was more in-depth data about attendance. And so this project was building the groundwork for if I needed to do kind of a deeper dive. Um, so I was able to get information about attendance that had been collected as part of a survey. And so I, which was made open source. And so I took that information um, and I used it to determine if I had found that yes, there did seem to be a correlation between people not having adequate access and attendance, then I might've had to go and, and start asking people and start creating surveys of my own. The reason why I didn't jump to do that because one, the data was the data already existed, and two, as I mentioned, um, underserved communities are often being asked for in the same information repetitively. It's exhausting. They're not um, given access to the findings, and it becomes uh, sort of a headache, and it, and it creates a, a, a power imbalance, and it becomes almost a nuisance for them. Um, and so I think as people in the arts, as we're doing these different data analysis, data analyses projects, um, it's, it is for us to look at what data we already have, because we also collect a lot of data in the arts and who's visiting. Um, it, it's for us to look at that and examine it and decide, do we actually need to go out and, and ask for more? Or can we um, kind of, can we reuse the data that we already have? I hope that answered your question. Please let me know if, if you wanted me to. Thank you very much, Jamila. Um, I think that the, the, the issue is particularly relevant. We see today um, there are different types of data. We see public data of the type of data that you mentioned. Uh, we're now moving into a situation where semi-public data, you know, sometimes it's about survey, but also private data. Uh, there is a sense nowadays that the era of, of the age of uh, free data in the terms of social media is coming to an end in different ways. Social media data has been used in various ways for building you know, um, uh, data, so building data projects. I think there they, is they, more to understand a little bit more how various categories of data give us uh, um, uh, different perspectives on the same issue. Um, and this is where you know, this interesting concept that you mentioned on data neutrality and how to assess that and how to put that into, especially when discussing the context of AI, AI machines becomes quite particularly uh, relevant. So let's uh, 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 use this you know, to move now to Katharina because she has published a report on exactly this uh, topic called AI um, and how data is being used or data diplomacy is being used in this context. So Katharina, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Cornelio. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel very honored to be uh, among all of you and have been listening with uh, great interest. But without further ado, let me get into the presentation, which is going to focus on um, diplomacy and, and the world of diplomatic practitioners. So that there is a great fit uh, with, uh, with this event today, but also I'm, I'm coming from the non-glam world, right? Um, so let me get into this. What I'm basing my presentation today on is a report uh, we did in 2007-2018 on um, data diplomacy. And the report builds on several workshops where we talk to diplomatic practitioners and ministries of foreign affairs to kind of understand how they see the role of data in their work and how they see the role of big data in their work. And, and if, if you want to map this very, very broadly, how in, in my view, data and uh, diplomatic practice comes together 
Um, there are four areas. So data can allow for better informed foreign policy. Um, it is a topic on the diplomatic agenda. So this, this comes down to governance and agreeing on norms and ethics. Data can serve as a tool to monitor emergencies, number three. And data is something that does shift uh, geopolitical power dynamics between countries, potentially. Um, here's a quote from the uh, UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, and I think, I believe this comes from 2012, so very early on in this whole discussion of how data becomes relevant for diplomatic practice. And um, it says, diplomats must harvest and adapt the best innovations from elsewhere. Big data will require us to reshape how we find and use information, how we deliver a service and how we network and um, influence. So again, kind of looking at a number of areas of um, diplomatic practice. And then if you ask this question again, uh, how does data and big data come into diplomatic practice when it comes to the tasks and functions of diplomacy, we ended up with five different areas. So there's the area of consular affairs, that are very practical when it comes to delivering services for citizens. There's diplomatic reporting, public diplomacy, of course, and this is the area um, where Cornelio is most, uh, uh, where Cornelio has published a lot, and this is a really interesting area of the application of both data and artificial intelligence. We are also talking about data for strategic planning and policy research, also something that uh, Jamila probably can relate to as she works for, for a ministry. And then data in the area of development and um, humanitarian work. Uh, in one of our workshops, when we asked um, diplomats, so how is data and big data most relevant for diplomacy? And um, two answers stood out. And as you can see, this is obviously not representative. This is from one workshop, but I think the result is really interesting. So when we talk about the, rele the relevancy of big data for diplomacy, one of the things practitioners, and, and this also comes out in several conversations we had, kind of focus on is, okay, this will allow us to predict um, crises. And actually still a number of years later, this is the area still most controversial when we talk about the application of big data. This is always the promise and kind of the hype, but in practice, it actually doesn't work that well, but it's kind of the hope associated with data analysis and big data when we bring it, for example, into diplomatic practice. The other part I want to draw your attention to is this uh, question of results in nice graphs. And we, we put it in, the, in this small survey kind of uh, in a kind of glib way. And as you can see, participants didn't really um, uh, see this as an important tool. In hindsight, we actually did get it wrong because we think of practitioners and practitioners applying the insights from data and big data in their work in decision making in policy making for example having um, illustrations having graphs having maps is actually the most important tool to convince them and to kind of move move things forward so i thought that that was a really interesting uh, learning experience for us so in terms of how data comes into diplomatic practice or examples. I have um, three examples. They all come from the area of development work and um, humanitarian work. And I'm going to go through, through them very quickly just to give you a flavor. So the first example comes from OCHA and the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is a huge collection of humanitarian data. What I pulled from them um, this time or for this occasion um, is data uh, on Ukraine, very timely data on Ukraine. And again, it's represented in a map, kind of give practitioners a very quick way of, of assessing the situation. Second example comes from UNHCR, um, where satellite imagery was used to map refugee camps, and in particular to understand how refugee camps are growing, and by understanding how they're growing, to be able to deliver services uh, more better and to react effectively to, to what is happening on the ground. And then my third example comes from UN Global Pulse, which is the entity within the United Nations that looks at uh, big data and artificial intelligence and how to apply that uh, in various contexts. And what they did, they developed a, a tool to listen to radio conversations in Uganda. So this comes out of their Uganda lab. Um, there are many different radio stations in Uganda and no human analyst can listen to all of them. There are also a number of different languages being spoken and they basically developed a machine tool to listen to these conversations or to understand better the context uh, in order to then react um, better to a given situation. And this is also something that is really important when we talk about mediation, um, peacemaking, conflict resolution. Um, so with that in mind, um, here's another quote that comes from our research. 
um, how diplomats see big data in their work. So big data, they say, can be particularly useful to substantiate arguments, challenge assumptions and bias in diplomatic reporting, and verify or challenge diplomatic judgments. Furthermore, when looking at data in a broader perspective, an extensive amount of data generated by the MFA remains underutilized, including more traditional data and records. So what I find really interesting with this is two points. First, challenge assumptions and bias. Um, and this perspective particularly comes again from, from the UK FCO, and they really develop data tools to kind of challenge some of the assumptions that were held within the administration. But what I find really interesting is that at the same time, we have to be very aware and we have a, a huge conversations about bias and discrimination um, uh, in big data. So for example, um, this famous book by Kay, Kay, Kathy O'Neill, um, Weapons of Math Destruction. So it's really interesting that practitioners see this positive um, side of, of data and big data, but at the same time, the larger conversation focuses on, on the bias. So how do we navigate that? And then more traditional data and records. And this I find really interesting because this is not just a question of digitizing existing data and records within foreign ministries, which to a large extent remain non-digitized. This is also a question, I think, how do we navigate different sources of data? How do we navigate different kinds of insight? And how do we navigate basically the old um, and um, the new? With this presentation, I was also asked to talk a little bit about um, ethical principles, norms, how to deal with, uh, with data in practice. And the best source to, um, especially when it comes to sensitive data and uh, personal data, the best source um, I think we can draw on is the ICRC and their recommendations of how to collect data, how to use data in a humanitarian context. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but basically they outline three uh, broad areas of principles. So here we have data processing principles, um, then data security and processing security, and then the rights of um, the data subject. And especially when it comes to collecting personal information, working with people directly, I think this last point is extremely important. I think it also relates really well to um, the point Jamila made on this question of why am I being researched? So who are the people we are going to for this information and what does it do to them when we ask them for this information? What rights do they have to, for example, reject to say, I, I don't want to be part of this research. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about um, governance principles when we talk about the use of, of data. And I have five here, um, very familiar to all of you, I guess, oversight, accountability, fairness, transparency, non-discrimination. And this also chimes well with a lot of frameworks we uh, have seen and have developed over the last couple of years. What comes to my mind, for example, is the uh, UN General Data Protection Framework, um, UN, no, the EU General Data Protection Regulation, and then, for example, more recently, UNESCO's recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So these principles are really well established, and we see them from a lot of different um, from a lot of different angles. Um, let me stop here, but with one final observation. There's one quote I usually like to bring into these conversations, um, which is from uh, um, a historian of technology called Melon Krenzberg, um, who says, um, technology is neither good nor bad, uh, nor is it neutral. And in these discussions on big data and AI, for example, we often talk about AI for good. So we talk about, okay, there, there are nefarious uses of this technology, but we can also put it to good purpose. Um, what is problematic with stopping at this level of observation is basically saying, okay, we have a technology that is, that is given and we can use it for good or bad. But the quote, however, highlights with this uh, last part of neither is it neutral is that we also have a role in shaping the technology itself. So when we think of social media, what are the rules of engagement? When we think of um, the use of data in diplomatic practice, again, what are the rules of engagement? How are we shaping this? And then it comes back to a governance question. And then on the basis of that, basically a question for all of us, how are we shaping our engagement with these types of technologies? I'm gonna stop on, on this note and hand back to Cornelio. Thank you very much, Katharina. A very um, a comprehensive uh, presentation of a topic which I'm, 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 I'm very uh, um, interested in as well. Um, uh, a couple of things, you know, come out from uh, from your um, uh, introduction here of the topic is um, one is this, this idea. I think uh, um, 
uh, it was mentioned also by uh, Gray before in, in a different context, uh, this idea of digital divide. You, we know now that data is power. Uh, some you know, economists some time ago call it data is a new oil, oil in the sense of a resource that is, you know, uh, gives you power. So th there is a question here about how, how data converts um, or you know, creates inequality. Uh, some, some uh, you, you investigated this a little bit uh, in the context of the big data uh, debate. Uh, so where do you see this digital divide? Uh, who are the winner and the losers of you know, the way in which we now aggregate data, process data? Um, it's not the same thing like social media when everybody can set up a Twitter account and then you know, you can, but with data, it's a bit more sophisticated. My impression is that, that in terms of how to collect data, different sources of data, how to engage in data diplomacy, being sure that you know the data that you collect are safe. You know, um, you have these data equivalency uh, agreements that are now being uh, negotiated between different countries. Um, so, one question for you: If you can uh, um, uh, expand a little bit of argument on this idea of digital divide or data divide, if you want it, uh, what does it mean for you, and to what extent is it a real thing? Does it? Do you see consequences of this happening? Definitely, that's the short answer. Um, I also really picked up on this when uh, Gray mentioned it in, in his presentation. A um, couple of points. Um, so this idea of data is the new oil, I think to some extent it's it's a useful metaphor, to some extent it's, it's really not a useful metaphor, kind of leading us in the wrong direction thinking about, um, about data. Having said this, there is uh, there is concern for digital divides. So for example, for my in my field, diplomatic practice, we might imagine some foreign ministries actually having the resources to put uh, into data analysis, uh, kind of prepare themselves much better for negotiations, to have a much better information source. And so this definitely ex exacerbates existing inequalities. The other point to um, to to make perhaps. There, there's a long history of um, extractivism, a long history of colonialism. And then when we move into this field of, of big data and artificial intelligence, there's a real concern of that history kind of repeating itself, um, of data extractivism, of a kind of neo-colonialism on the basis of big data and artificial intelligence. And this has to do with a number of factors. One factor is infrastructure. And if those countries who have the infrastructure to build on these uh, resources and opportunities in those countries who do not have the infrastructure to build on that. So for example, when we look at something like the AI readiness um, report and the AI readiness um, um, overview, which is basically every year, I think coming out of Oxford Insights, looking at the ability of governments to uh, use big data and artificial intelligence for their work. And it's not surprising that, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa scores uh, lowest as a region, way below the, um, the average, the world average. Um, and at the same time, this has a lot to do with, with legacies, with lack of infrastructure, with lack of capacities, um, with lack of um, data scientists. I mean, having said this, there's a problem of brain drain. And at the same time, from the region, for example, there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of universities and collaborations of universities that try to address this and basically say, okay, we have the data here, we need to make the best use of the data um, that basically we have, that we own, instead of giving it away for free. Um, so it's a really complicated issue. It's, uh, it's clear that this problem exists. It's clear that this problem is not going to change very quickly because as I said, it depends on infrastructure, it depends on capacities, but it's also clear that there's a, a strong um, push back on this, especially with local initiatives and um, people re really realize that it's a problem and trying to address it on, um, uh, trying, to, trying to address it. Okay. Thank you very much. Just to connect a little bit also to, to the, the, the role of GLAM institutions, uh, I've been wondering uh, if I can uh, appeal to Sheldon uh, uh, just briefly. Uh, in this context that uh, Katharina mentioned, uh, do you see this from your work, from the way in which you approach different uh, uh, cultural activities, this issue of data divide or digital divide <clears throat> being present, being visible in the way in which you um, uh, engage with, with cultural uh, activities, uh, or it's, it's not yet there. Uh, 
I've been wondering if you can give us some insight uh, from inside about how these issues mentioned by Katharina play out uh, in your context. I think it's something that we're starting to see purely because of COVID uh, kind of forcing that differentiation. But I think otherwise, just in the day to day of seeing a standard museum exhibition, it's not quite something that that has really taken shape yet. Um, so I guess it's something that uh, we'll have to we'll be looking at for the next couple of years, because I imagine that that it'll it'll with with the onset of COVID and with this divide beginning um, in a really serious way, that is something that we'll see more of. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Um, uh, again, you know, I, I come uh, uh, back to you in case you have, you know, uh, further question to put into the, into the, the uh, chat room. Meanwhile, um, uh, let me move now to Ralukam. Uh, so try to make sense now, what does it mean? Right, we are moving into an era, you know, when the social media arrived, you know, we try to understand, you know, what kind of ramification it creates for us, for our social life, for our political life. And guess what? You know, we're still trying to find out how it works. Uh, but Raluca is looking ahead and has some <laughs> interesting uh, things to, to tell us. Uh, please, Raluca, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cornelio. And thank you, Natalia, as well, and all the um, previous panelists with their excellent interventions. As a disclaimer, I'm also not uh, in the glam sector. So uh, by trade or let's say by profile, I'm an international relations researcher. And my current work uh, focuses on this intersection between critical security studies and um, science and technology studies. And I'm really interested in how, for instance, um, new and emerging technologies uh, shape, mediate, and impact you know, violence in general, uh, but also how they uh, shape and transform our uh, future. And uh, my presentation will be more security and defense oriented. So again, my second disclaimer here. But uh, before I start um, uh, reflecting a little bit on this, um, I would like to share maybe an experience I had recently. So I live in Belgium and I recently visited in Flanders Fields Museum in Ypres. So this is a museum dedicated to the study of First World War. And um, one element that struck me was the excellent storytelling dimension and the immersion uh, that uh, the museum offered me by especially using soldiers' letters to depict the devastation and the tragedy of the war, but also the surgical and lethal effectiveness of using innovative weapons. One of them was poisonous gas in this instance. And um, because of um, reading and writing at the time a lot on artificial intelligence, it made me wonder what stories will be used to depict, for instance, AI-powered weapons in warfare and conflict situations, and what future imaginaries and worldviews will actually be constructed by such storytelling, and how these past depictions, as well as um, uh, lethal technologies used in, in conflict situations, will also, you know, inform um, these types of uh, future or present imaginary of the technology. So in my research, I focus a lot uh, on imaginative thinking uh, about intelligent ma machines. And uh, my research also led me to this discovery that actually this imaginative thinking um, dates back to ancient times, uh, to Homeric poems such as Iliad and Odyssey and Automata. And uh, imaginaries and narratives for, from this point of view are essential to what I call and other researchers in science and technology studies called the co-production of science and technology, as well as how people's engagement with new knowledges, governance processes, and political horizons is also co-shaped co by the intersection between culture, science, and technology. So in this view, imaginaries of artificial intelligence reflect ethical and social values, shape public hopes and fears, inspire technological research and innovation, but they also shape the way we interact with our past, present, and future. So from this point of view, I view humans, culture, art as uh, co-producing, you know, science, artificial intelligence. So not only scientists, engineers, and programmers as, um, you know, the essential moving parts uh, of the technological progress, but as well as how culture through centuries of discourse, uh, through images and storytelling, um, 
how, for, for instance, um, um, pop culture is also depicting su such technologies is shaping the way we understand uh, AI powered security and defense technologies from, um, so from, for instance, from thinking about how ancient automatons um, were depicted in the Iliad and Odyssey to, uh, I don't know, 20th century robots and uh, the well-known play by Karel Kapec, uh, the, the Czech author and the, how he invented the word robota um, uh, in the earlier 20th century, but also how more uh, contemporary visions of science fiction, artificial super, uh, super intelligence play out more broadly in our culture, but also our uh, scientific thinking about this technology. So from this point of view, as AI becomes even more advanced, um, uh, what exactly are we constructing? And what AI imaginaries reveal about this evolving technology in relation to global affairs, to diplomacy, um, to power structures, to, to divide global north and global south, but also how they mediate uh, human violence or even shape human violence. So for instance, how increasingly AI-powered security and defense technologies are co-produced, impact human-machine relations, um, and how these types of uh, mediations then produce new, first of all, new knowledges, but also new um, ways uh, of lethality. Uh, but yeah, um, I would not want to go too much into these doom and gloom scenarios. However, my own research again about uh, the imaginaries of artificial intelligence is the fact that most of times when thinking about military artificial intelligence or at least um, the ways in which it has been depicting, you always fall into extremes. Either, I, either utopian depicting this techno solution is dimension that these types of technologies would bring to the table, their cost efficiency, their effectiveness um, in their use, but also the doom and gloom Terminator-like scenarios that we often see depicted in Hollywood. And for me, this is quite interesting as well, because um, uh, the, the way they play out, for instance, um, within broader public imaginaries, uh, this also trickles down in policy processes, decision-making, funding allocation, the way, for instance, practitioners, defense experts, policy uh, decision-makers then uh, take the decision in deploying or even funding for uh, the development of these types of technologies. Um, or to use Sheila Yasanov and San Kyung Kim's term, how, for instance, do these social technical imaginaries in national strategies and military cultures um, uh, contribute, for instance, to this arms race in uh, researching and developing these types of technologies? But what I'm most interested in is also what are the geographic, temporal, as well as the linguistics differences in depicting these types of military AI um, uh, technology renderings across the global stage, and especially when it comes to the security and defense domains. What does it mean to militarize artificial intelligence in the context of uh, the evolving digital world that we are living in? And what are the, these utopian and dystopian imaginings of machine futures in both the real and the digital battlefield? Um, so in this sense, I consider that worldviews and imaginaries constrain our choices of understanding some of these problems, but also set the agenda and the tone for how, for instance, we will engage in the future with the dual use dimensions of these technologies, namely also their civil, but also military applications of the technologies. So for instance, how are um, uh, narratives of AI being created and how is the use of hype uh, and metaphors, you know, uh, instrumentalized in national strategies or for instance, by defense practitioners? Um, this is quite interesting because uh, both Natalia and Cornelio mentioned data is the new oil, but most of the times the more, let's say, dystopian use of uh, military AI is also by using, an, uh, uh, depicted is also by using a metaphor like killer robots, for instance. So importantly, the discourses and depictions used to communicate techno-scientific research is influential and terminologies have different meanings and effects in different communities, communities of research, communities of practice, 
practice, practice uh, also the military community, and of course, in the context um, more broadly of the current, you know, arising and evolving geopolitical uh, geopolitical tension that we are currently living in. So, uh, I was also asked to reflect a bit uh, more into in terms of the glam sector. Uh, so, a cultural institution such as galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, such in the Flanders Field Museum, for instance, uh, can support more well-informed public debates about some of these imaginaries, utopian, dystopian imaginaries about military AI, um, and be uh, involved as more community values in storytelling also about war and new technology, and how uh, war and uh, old technologies can also inform um, uh, public debates, but also uh, how the future can be imagined uh, regarding this, uh, these applications. And the, the implications also various interventions in the co-production of social technical knowledge, not only from the science and technology communities, but also from um, the cultural world, but uh, as well as from practitioners and decision makers in the military domain. Prevalent fictional narratives around uh, AI are um, uh, typically uh, based on a limited number of recurrent westernized motives. And this is quite important, and this was reflected in the discussion today as well uh, in some of the presentations, uh, such, for, such as, for instance, anthropomorphic AI. And this, uh, funnily enough, Cor uh, Cornelius shared the uh, Guardian article, and some of the first lines in that article are about a thinking robot. Um, and this is also part and parcel of this Hollywoodian way of understanding these types of technologies, but this is a very limited way of understanding its potential applications also in the security and defense field and military domain, um, and especially in terms of military hard power projection. So this focus on embodiment and extremes um, I would say um, is a very limited and narrowing way to uh, depict and imagine the potential of the th uh, technology, but also its lethality and its danger, for instance, uh, in deploying it um, in the human battle space, and how, for instance, this technology will be used um, in teaming with humans, for instance, or how, for instance, a lethal decision making will be relegated to algorithms uh, and be used uh, in, in warfare. Um, I will uh, just uh, maybe mention one thing and, and stop here. Uh, Cornel, yes, go ahead. Oh, that we need to, to wrap up. Yes. So um, in, in this, just to wrap up, uh, what is quite interesting about uh, trying to work with the techno scientific um, narratives, imagination, epistemologies, but also to put to think about uh, their positionality, where they emanate, what are the mainstream motives and discourses, try to unpack these and also try to understand places of resistance or alternative uh, uh, imaginaries and what role, for instance, cultural institutions, but also also um, us as researchers can play to debunk some of these more you know, used and you use tropes is very much important because at this point, what, um, it's a, uh, what I understand by desirable or better uh, worldviews about artificial military, artificial intelligence is very much in the making. The imaginary is being built uh, and there is a need for these alternative voices and imaginaries, especially when it comes to this highly sensitive and potentially lethal application of this technology. I stop here, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raluca. I mean, it's fascinating to listen to you to, because you know it prompted me thinking uh, that most of the discussion that we have with Katharina and you know in other events and so on, it was about how the present influences the past. We have to understand, you know, what kind of technologies are now being built so that you know we can see the consequences. You take the opposite view in a sense and say, well, you know, thinking about the future actually may influence the way in which we can think about some of the imaginary of the future can think of, can have implication for the present. But also prompts a question. I know that we are short of time, so very uh, briefly. Yeah, uh, I just want to pick up on your last point on the places of resistance, places of resistance to imaginary, because resistance can be this kind of connotation that you find the power, the bad power, in a sense. But what if the imaginary in the context of our discussion today is disinformation, 
right, um, is, you know, a fake reality. There is very much interest in our days in the concept of post-reality. Post-reality meaning that there is no unified reality, but the fragmented reality informed by various ways in which uh, things are. And people live in this post-reality, believe that particular information environment, and we see now nowadays in various contexts. So, uh, how is what's your concept of resistance in this case? You know, thinking about uh, future imaginaries defined by new technologies. Any thoughts on this? I know putting you on the spot immediately. It's, uh, it's no, no worries. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic, and I usually approach this issue from this notion of technological spectacle that we uh, typically see uh, when it comes to new and emerging technologies. In the way hype, for instance, and also fake news or disinformation about the real, uh, uh, you know, bandwidth of some of these technologies and what they can do. And what I found quite interestingly enough that this is all also part of a media machine and it's mostly industry driven uh, especially from weapons manufacturers when it comes to potentially you know selling the hype of some of these technologies I'm thinking of the cases for instance of Boston Dynamics I don't know if you uh, came across of these walking dogs and jumping robots uh, and so on this this type of very um, hyped but also lucrative way to depict the technology drives this process. And it's very uh, difficult then to resist the spectacle, the lure, the, the, you know, the, the way in which this is insidiously being played out and also taken up by uh, policymakers as well uh, at the same time in selling the techno solutionism and the silver bullet that some of these technologies can bring in solving complex problems such as even security and defense problems. So here the resistance needs to come from both military, uh, in my field, uh, military practitioners in understanding the complexities of the technology, but also by the ones that are being uh, developing these types of technologies. And we have already seen this type of um, issues already, for instance, in, in different projects run by Google um, uh, in, in drone uh, development and how, for instance, designers and uh, programmers are resisting here. However, this is this debate is very distorted. Um, the power structures are very important here. And I like the way you framed uh, this, Cornelio, because in the sense, the symmetries in terms of mainstreaming certain views about artificial intelligence are still uh, concentrated in a handful of high-powered, uh, you know, circles. Um, and uh, this is quite problematic. And we have, on the one hand, the very Silicon Valley type of drive and high and excitement about emerging technologies, but at the same time, we also have the typical uh, levers of the military industrial complex <laughs> and the decision makers, especially when some, some of these technologies are being framed in this geopolitical arms race us versus them rationales that we often saw, for instance, during the Cold War era. I don't know if I answered the question, but this, uh, this was my very <laughs> quick reaction to your question. Thank you very much. It's a pity we don't have much time to, to uh, dive into the, the topic, but uh, thank you also, uh, Gray, for, for sharing with us, you know, some uh, already applications of, of the, the Boston Tech uh, technology deployed in, in Singapore uh, in a very, uh, you know, uh, quite dystopian uh, perspective, actually. Um, so I'm going to stop here. I know that Natalia is quite upset with me because I, I run off the time, so I'm going to <laughs> the floor uh, back to Natalia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carnella. I have dual feelings because we have to keep in time and we are running out of time. So we're far behind our schedule, unfortunately. But at the same time, I'm very happy we had such a brilliant, engaging conversations with so many uh, illuminating insights from the experts that really apply to the museum field. So uh, just now I would like to move on very quickly to the how-to discussion forum that will feature expert guest speakers to share their ideas and suggestions on dealing with misinformation and fake news, understanding that data biases, and combating digital misrepresentations. It is my pleasure to facilitate this panel with a team of uh, really great participants who include Barbara Tramelli, research grant holder in the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities uh, of uh, Kafor Sari University, 
Peter Prohlman Wengerfeld, Professor in Media and Communication in Malmo University, Alessandro Staffar, Responsible Innovation Consultant, and uh, TJ Thompson, Senior Lecturer in Visual Communication and Media at Queensland University of Technology. Each of these experts will share their own practical advice for museums, how to deal with all these complexities. And without <laughs> any interruption, they just give uh, the words to TJ to start the conversation. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you all. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully we can see what I'm looking at on Chrome. Is that right? Um, so far, the black screen from you. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get there. I'll just minimize some things. And is that better? Yep. Beautiful. All right. So I'll stick to my five minutes very closely. I started out as a visual journalist back in the day. I'm now an academic with an interest in all things visual communication. So I'll, I'll try to give us two things to, to um, parse through with our time today. I'll try to illuminate some verification practices when we're dealing with visual myths or disinformation. How do we um, verify that? Some, some challenges in that space and also some approaches to practical tips for verification. At the outset, though, I should just also note that two things. Um, these insights are coming from this article my team and I published in 2020 in Journals and Practice. You can um, read it online if you like, or I can send it to you directly via email, whatever you prefer. And at the outset, I'll just make one note to also that um, the, the issue of visual mis- and disinformation is really troubling and really um, tricky because of primarily two reasons. That's the scale of the issue and the speed at which the issue travels. And so we see there so many different images, so many different hours of video being uploaded to online um, platforms every day, and the speed at which these images and videos are being distributed are really um, just mind-boggling in terms of trying to be able to get your, hand, uh, your mind across this content and be able to try to grapple with what is real, what is not real, um, what is potentially misleading in this content. Uh, it can be really mind-boggling. So those first, just a little bit of, of nuance with our, our challenges. Folks oftentimes use language like fake news, but when we look at the academic literature, um, scholars like Claire Wardle have advanced a really sophisticated, nuanced understanding of a continuum of information disorder. Everything from um, satire and parody on one side to fully synthetic media on the other side. So, so here's a few different ways that um, visual misinformation and disinformation exist online, some of the different nuances with this. We see probably the most prevalent form of mis- and disinformation being decontextualized information. So old footage, old videos, resurfacing and being claimed as new. This is happening right now in Ukraine, where you have historic footage um, being claimed as new, and the caption will try to indicate this is happening right now when really it happens perhaps months or years ago, or perhaps in different geographical contexts. We also have um, things like copy move, cloning and splicing happening, in this case, to try to incite racial um, tensions. And so folks are using, in this example, Photoshop to manipulate an image and just change one finger, but that finger change makes a big difference in how you interpret the image. We have, um, juxtapositions going on where folks are taking multiple different images together and trying to splice them into one larger image for a more sensationalist effect. Oftentimes this happens with weather events and um, natural disasters, that kind of thing. We have retouching, nothing new, but we have politicians and other figures who want to look perhaps a bit slimmer, perhaps a bit um, or tan or whatever the, the beauty standard is in a particular culture. And so we have those retouching effects going on to those folks online profiles. And then even simple, small little things like cropping can really impact the vantage points and what can be seen in an image. So here's Trump's, um, Trump's Donald, former US President Donald Trump's inauguration scene from 2016. You can see on, on left, the full frame image showing the full um, Washington Plaza and the population there, the crowd there. And that right, the cropped version that looks a lot more um, crowded and a lot more well attended and you only see a portion of the scene. And simple things like um, blurring too. The National Archives in the States got in trouble a little bit ago for blurring these protest placards that were critical of former President Trump in an exhibition that it hosted. And so even really small things like just blurring out little tiny portions of an image can get folks into trouble or can incite controversy um, when you have an archive or a repository it's trying to be a record of a historical past. And lastly, one of these challenges and issues is simple things like saturation or desaturation, playing with colors, um, especially when it comes to race and, and, and skin color, that kind of thing, it can make a difference. Just boosting up color a little bit or desaturating color a little bit can make a big difference in how people perceive an image. 
So what can we do with our, our understanding of these challenges? A few practical tips. One of these is reverse image searches. So popping something into a platform like Google Images or to TenEye and trying to see where else an image exists on the web, where else it's been published. That can give you a sense of provenance, perhaps. The tricky thing is that um, sometimes even just simple edits like reversing an image's orientation from left to right can trick up those search engines and can fool them and make it think it's an entirely new image. So with this particular approach and with all the approaches I'll share, there's unfortunately not one silver bullet solution. It really does require a bricolage approach of different approaches and practices to try to get closer to the idea of truth than just kind of one um, nice, easy one-stop shop. We can look at metadata, so that's the, the um, information that's stored in our images when our camera makes the image. So things like GPS coordinates, camera settings, camera device that makes the image, that kind of thing. But the unfortunate bit here is that when you put those images on social media, all that information usually gets stripped out. There are certain platforms that um, don't have that, that same uh, um, process and policy to strip out metadata, but a lot of platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram do have that policy. And if you want to be a really kind of uh, forensic data scientist, you can look into um, geometry and physics and optics and light and scene and see where, for example, things uh, like light and shadows are falling. And if things have been shoddily added or removed from a scene, hopefully with that forensic approach, you can make sense of how the shadows are supposed to look in the scene and whether they actually are um, looking accurate, how they would uh, fall in a, in a real scene. Um, also with some kind of shoddy Photoshop, you can sometimes see halos and traces of where things have been cloned out if you boost up the contrast or the brightness of an image. And then two strategies left for us. Um, there's these nice utopian ones like blockchain that try to um, champion themselves as the future uh, in terms of provenance and be able to authentically verify where an image has been and to um, attest to where it's going and where, where it, um, if it's been changed, that kind of thing. Uh, but this requires a lot of cooperation from a lot of different stakeholders, from camera makers to platforms and providers and information um, republishers. And the cynical side of me thinks that perhaps that amount of cooperation at that large scale is a bit um, idealistic, perhaps. We'll see how that pans out in the, in the future. But the last strategy I'll share and the way I'll, I'll leave us with is the idea of, of you as the audience member being the most important um, weapon against mis and disinformation and being able to try to cultivate your media literacy, understanding things like sources and um, practices and how images are edited, how visuals are edited. Um, the AAP commissioned me and a few of my colleagues to write these articles about media literacy. If you'd like to Google them and my name, you can find these and get a little bit more in depth on how to cultivate your own media literacy. I think I'm just at a minute or two over time, but thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, TJ. That's such a brilliant and interesting uh, presentation and very, very helpful tips, I guess, for those who are still developing this uh, visual digital literacy to understand uh, the fake news and uh, to better navigate this uh, very saturated informational environment. So I will challenge each participant with just one uh, question in the very end. A and I would like now to move to Alisar, uh, who will talk more about how to address the challenge of data biases. Alisar? Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. All right. So let me just move you all up. There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alisar Mustafa, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a responsible innovation consultant that works at the intersection of policy, tech, and data analytics to bridge advocacy and policy change. Uh, I just want to say that this presentation is a very brief summary of the really long work and project that we've done. So if you're interested in more information, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so today I just want to talk to you about a consult this consulting proje project I did for the United States Census Bureau to develop a toolkit to help educate and equip federal government agencies to recognize and minimize bias in their respective government data sets and algorithm implementations. In this presentation, I will walk you through two parts of the project. The first part is our user-centered design methodology, where we did user interviews, and the second part is the toolkit prototype. Right, so the main question we focused on was how can the toolkit work for state and local government officials? To answer the question, we drafted some initial personas and we wanted to test if they were accurate. So we found representatives in each group to do user interviews. 
Based on these personas, we interviewed people in two categories, uh, the government um, agencies and then academia. And based on those interviews, we updated our personas. And the first one was a state, city, or county department official whose main concern would be to design AI that helps their team make better decisions. The second one is a chief information officer who wants to educate their team on the harm that AI can perpetuate so they can procure systems that minimize bias. And lastly, a chief data officer who would want to enable secure data sharing. So we had some key insights from this project. The first one is that government officials have little guidance on what ethical and unbiased technology means and how it is developed. And I also want to reiterate, I'm in the United States. So this is only based on the United States government. I know this is an international audience. Um, the second insight is agencies do not have the capacity or technical knowledge to develop AI ML models internally. It is important to have external ethical reviews of the models regular feedback from communities impacted by the models and subject matter experts is critical. And lastly, state and local officials welcome in input and guidance from the federal government. However, community partners may be skeptical. All right, so the updated question that we had is how might we empower state and local officials to minimize bias in the AI, AI ML models they implement? And our solution was a website that hosts educational content, guidelines, and technical tools tailored towards the user's knowledge and role. And now I will walk you through the prototype that we created. Unfortunately, I can't share with you the final um, product. So as you see, this would be the landing page. And you'd go down, you go to get directed to relevant resources. And from there, we would ask you, what industry do you work in? And you can choose from government, agency, government data information office, the private sector or academia. So let's say we can pick government agency. And then the second question would be what most closely describes your role? And you can answer by saying, I manage public sector services. I lead or facilitate we're, the procurement We're process. still seeing the presentation, sorry. Oh, perfect, great. All right, so this is what I was talking about. This, um, it will take you into a journey map and we would ask you a couple of questions. Like I said, what industry do you work in? You pick the industry, then you go into what most closely describes your role. And then um, you can pick that from a, very, a variety of answers. Um, and then the third question is, what is your knowledge base on artificial intelligence and machine learning? And you can answer from, I'm completely new to I am a data scientist, ML engineer. And then we would ask, what is your depth of knowledge on bias in data and algorithms? And you can answer from, I'm just starting to learn about this topic, all the way to, I understand how bias shows up in both data and algorithms. And finally, what we ask, what brings you to the toolkit? And you can answer by saying, I'm currently building an AI ML model, or I'm just interested in how AI ML kind of shows up in the public sector. So after we submit, it takes, the tool takes you to your personalized resources. And from there, you can go into mapping the process, understanding bias, case studies, templates, technical tools, and finally understanding AI ML. The most exciting part for me that I love about this toolkit is mapping the process because it takes you through a step-by-step -step, uh, process of how you would implement and build AI and ML. And if you were to click on them, it asks you more detailed questions and gives you more detail on how to do it. But the steps are you know, identifying the problem and challenge, IDA, engage the community, consult with AI practitioners and experts, consider how to design and implement AI, write and release requests for proposals to design AI, evaluate RFPs, and again, design AI ethical reviews and community feedback is very important step to, to redo, implement and monitor, pilot, evaluate, and then scale and monitor. All right, and that's my presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was very interesting. And I hope that in the future, your tool will also target some other kind of audiences, not only the governments, but also cultural institutions who are also dealing with this problem of addressing the data biases, uh, because they deal a, a lot without data. And in the 21st century, museums are kind of becoming these centers of generating big data. So, and uh, with this, I move to Peel. Uh, 
from Malmo University who will talk more about the data and the uses and the meaning of data in museums. So the floor is yours right now. Thank you. And uh, I'll try to uh, get to slide sharing uh, quite directly. So this uh, brief intervention builds on my experiences with what I've been working with Malmö Museums, but also for myself as a visiting researcher at Estonian National Museum. And in there, a collaborative project about museums and in events measuring impact on local environments with data analytics. And, and I think this has been quite sort of revealing uh, engagement for me uh, when uh, museums and cultural organizations who are not necessarily used to working with data suddenly uh, start uh, actively engaging with uh, with different kinds of data practices and what do they then struggle with. So my uh, discussion will, will repeat many of the things other people have already said, so I'll try to keep it relatively brief. So what is data in museums uh, is, is perhaps something that different museums will know uh, from, from their own perspectives. But I think it's also important to say that museums often have more data than they give themselves credit to. So when we were trying to do a bit of data audit in or, or not really labeling it as data audit uh, for themselves, we were looking over at Estonia National Museum, different kinds of data sources. There is a lot of information going on. And oftentimes museums have more data Data, then they uh, they know what to do with. So there is this what Yamila mentioned, like over gathering data. So we do tend to sort of gather perhaps more data than we than we actually know what to do in good sense. Especially when everyone's so excited about the big data and and all that promise that it brings, uh, which again leads me to my next question: sort of what kind of data we can then take to be indicative of engagement with people. And there's lots of different ways of we have the traditional uh, data gathering methods like surveys, polls, observations, museums uh, often have practices of engaging, for instance, or in particular Estonian National Museum, they engage in turns to do observations on the floor. And, uh, and again, there is more data gathering happening than maybe the analytics or, or, or sort of uh, uh, delving deeper into understanding what did we now learn from this. There is also lots of online data collection ways. There is website visitor analytics, social media profiling. We can pop up online surveys to, to do different things for our websites. There is ticket sales on point of sale, website sales, but also different kind of ways of uh, locating visitors in the actual museum. And they can be more invasive in a sense that they can uh, try to recruit users uh, mobile phones to do that work or they can be also um, uh, museums often have digital interactives that have uh, log data that museums actually not that often use or analyze so there is already automatically collected data that ends up in IT engineers table that they don't necessarily care or don't necessarily have insight what to do with and the museum professionals don't even know what to ask in those cases or those instances. So, but uh, I just thought sort of to bring two sort of critical questions. Can we read this data that we have? And here is a Google Analytics, a random screenshot from, from website. So it's not indicative of any particular, uh, particular museum or, or organization. But I just wanted to sort of show how Google Analytics is giving us a lot of different numbers. And oftentimes these numbers are very uh, context free, so they're very difficult to actually make really deep sense of. Uh, it's it's just just really uh, it's just numbers, and it also what it often also gives is a promise of growth and a promise of future expansion, which is almost unlimited. So the, sort of with digital clicks and uh, collections, new users, engagement, minutes, seconds, it only can get better. And if it doesn't get better, you get sort of a dark red line downwards, and then it's a huge sort of like, and it impacts us as, as people, because we have come to a certain extent uncritically think numbers are good. And you've heard many people say this, you, like data, you have to really think what it does, where it comes from, and who collects it, and who's interested in uh, serving. And to be quite honest, 
Google data serves Google interest. It does not really serve GLAM organization's interest, but we can try to sort of make do with it. But we really have to accept that all this kind of data is collected with someone else's interest in mind. So, so be critical and be careful when you use this kind of material. The other uh, uh, data I wanted to show you comes from our MeMind project. And here the question is, can we trust this data? So this is an example with, from an experiment that we tried to do with, this is the Stoner National Museum. It's a huge, tiny, tiny map. And, and uh, we took people's digital tickets that they can use to click on digital interactives and use that log data to try to trace people across the museum. So these are different pathways. You can see a Finnish pathway or Estonian pathway, English or French or Russian pathway, or people who've spent actually quite a lot of time in museums. So you can see that they, they've engaged quite intensively with different, uh, different interactives. Uh, and, and but the challenge is it looks very beautiful. It looks like it has a lot of interesting information, but it also gives you uh, an illusion of overload of information. And, and to be quite honest, when we try to sort of contrast this information that we got from the ticket logs to the observation data that museum also had, the observation data gives more nuanced and, and better insights. But the ticket logs look so much more cool, don't they? So I think it's also that the data does have a cool factor. Uh, and, and that cool factor, it, we, need to, we need to take with a pinch of salt and, uh, and really try to look what is behind that information. Why, what, what is this ticket log telling us that we would not know otherwise? And just to sort of finally come to a few uh, conclusive remarks uh, is also, uh, so how can museums develop their data literacy? So I think one of the things that we really can do and need to do is to understand the difference between primary and secondary data, between quantitative and qualitative. That some, the qual quantitative data is not necessarily better than the qualitative, they are different, as well as primary and secondary data that primary data that we collect ourselves, we can, we can uh, guide the data collection much more efficiently, but at the same time, maybe we already have that data from secondary sources and we can, we can use that. Have an overview of the data that museums have and data others have that is relevant to them. So really investing time and effort to try to make sense. Of what do we already know and how we can set that uh, knowledge together is a really important step. Structure and organize your internal data to answer questions concerning your organization. This is just a sort of a snippet of information that we got. We were talking with a uh, with data analysis company and they were thinking, oh, we could do these and these correlations and look for these and these things. And then the accountant that we had in the house where we tried to get, so, okay, let's get some ticket sales information that contrast that with some other data. And the, and the ticket sales information was already telling us so many rich stories that we had no idea because we had never really bothered to ask. So I think that's also sort of make an inventory of data that you have and make a sort of see a really in-depth uh, plunge on, on trying to figure out the stuff that you already know. And finally, always consider the context in which secondary data is collected, whose interest does it serve? Does it serve the museum organization interest or does it have other interests in mind and, and then whose it is? And just a final plug is the MeMind, um, project website and our research program data society website where you'll find also some of my latest publications on this topic thanks thank you so much Pil. this is a really really brilliant and straight to the topic presentation that raised a lot of concerns and questions that actually you know transfer us to the next webinar that we are running on wednesday when we present some of the answers to the questions the critical questions that you just raised and i'm going to pick up on all your points that you made today and address them very critically in my own uh, prototype of uh, uh, you know uh, measuring digital soft power drawing by on the quantitative data collected by museums so and right now very very quickly i would like to <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to invite uh, Barbara to the floor uh, to give some insights on the challenges that museums are addressing in, you know, sharing their collections online and what could be done to, uh, to address these challenges. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, thank you very much, Natalia. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. I should just share my screen. And if you 
can confirm. Okay, can you can you see the screen? I guess. Yes, thank you very much. Well, first of all, again, thanks to everybody, really, because it was a, a wonderful session this morning and I, I learned a lot. So first of all, thank you, uh, Natalia and Laura and Cornelio for inviting me. I will be very, very brief, I, I promise you. Um, I just want to share with you my uh, experience working as, uh, not really specifically in the GLAM sector, I work more from an academic point of view as a research grant holder at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. Um, just in a nutshell, uh, uh, the center is part of the Department of Humanities in Kafoska University in Venice, uh, and it supports the development and the accessibility and dissemination of research and teaching in the digital and public humanities. Uh, it facilitates uh, the exchange and the coordination between existing experience and by inspiring new digital projects. So it's quite new. It was established in 2019 and founded upon an initiative of excellence that aim at stimulating an interdisciplinary methodological discourse to serve as basis for collaborative de development of durable and reusable and shared resources for research. So the domains include digital textual scholarship, digital and public art history, digital and public history, and digital cultural heritage, and digital and public uh, archaeology. So it, it, we collaborate with the various research projects with local, national, and international partner institutions coordinating the current master in digital and public humanities and organizing uh, different events. Directed by Professor Franz Fischer, we have a whole range of activities uh, to support and encourage the improvement and the accessibility and the dissemination of projects of digital and public humanities. So what we are aiming at is to stimulate an interdisciplinary methodological discourse and to serve uh, as uh, uh, collaborative resources in order in uh, tangen tangential to the glam sector. Um, for what concern uh, some of the topics that uh, we have seen today uh, concerning digital audiences and communication, um, one of the things that we are uh, keen on doing is to advance digital education against misrepresentation and misuse of data uh, online. Then what we are trying to do is to foster digital community building in order to establish new collaboration, uh, both with the academic and non-academic uh, participants Participants. Then what we are also uh, driving our attention to is to consolidate what is actually the field of digital humanities, on which there is still a lot of discussion. Um, I'll just show you briefly some of uh, the objectives of the center. The mission is to stimulate, as I said, an interdisciplinary methodological discourse. Uh, the principles are methodological awareness, collaboration, and interoperability through openness of the projects that we are fostering. Now we have more than 60 projects going, ranging from digital textual scholarships, such as Catullus Online, to digital collections of the Galleria Borghese in Rome, the epigraphic database uh, uh, FALSE, uh, the development of the platform Carmus, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have a whole wide range of uh, projects supporting uh, uh, tangential to that, but central to the, cent to the center activity are the seminars that uh, uh, we are organizing, so events, workshops, seminars, and news in digital and public humanities, the master in digital uh, and public humanities, the summer school. So uh, especially this year, summer school, we are very thrilled because it will finally take place <laughs> in Venice and not online as uh, it was for the past two years, unfortunately, due, due to COVID the pandemic. And uh, for what concern uh, my work as digital art historian, we will uh, uh, build on Venice artistic heritage as well as the, in the occasion of the current Art Biennale. And we will devote uh, the summer school to digital and public aspects of art historical research. So um, what I am uh, specifically focusing on is investigating digital museum collection and database building. So uh, we are aware that the potential of museum to create meaningful experiences, meaningful digital experiences for people of all origins and backgrounds is central to the social value of a museum and one of the objectives as agent of change and an institution, uh, an authoritative institution, there is no time like the present for museums to uh, demonstrate the relevance 
of uh, uh, by engaging constructively in the political and social and cultural realities of the digital society of an increasing digital society. So some of the things that I focus on uh, both for my research and for the teaching is to gain insights into scientific analytical approaches and interdisciplinary collaboration of the GLAM professionals, analyzing and interpreting digital texts and images, studio practices and digitization technologies against digital misrepresentation and understanding different methods of database collection building and good practices of the digitization and standardization of data. And this is something, this last uh, uh, objective is very dear to me as I uh, currently work uh, on a project on uh, Renaissance illustrations, building a, a reusable and uh, uh, open access uh, database of illustration in collaboration with, with the Visual Geometry Group in Oxford, at the Department of Engineering Science, at the Equipex Biblissima in France, uh, and the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. So fostering international uh, collaborations and uh, uh, through my own, uh, well, uh, relatively small project, uh, of course, uh, uh, compared with the big data that uh, some of you presented today, um, we're sort of finding a way to methodologically develop the openness of research projects and the reusability of research projects, especially concerning illustrations and the digital images, which can be sometimes very, very challenging. Uh, so for what concern uh, some of the, well, advice, I, I, as uh, DJ said, there is no silver bullet solution. I wouldn't dare to, to propose one, but there is some, uh, advice that I can give uh, building from my own experience. First of all, uh, we need to foster always interdisciplinarity, both in academic and non-academic fields because uh, different competencies can give you different feedback and can open up to uh, new uh, things that you did not consider when developing your own digital project or even when building your own uh, digital catalog. So a dialogue outside of your comfort zone is essential, especially to uh, against the building of fake news and data misrepresentation. Uh, we are living in troubled times. The level of anxieties in this period uh, arose uh, beyond uh, what we could have believed, at least what could I have believed. But but uh, I think that keeping an open mind and keeping uh, uh, an open uh, dialogue with the, the partners that you're working with uh, for uh, developing your own digital project is essential in order to um, sort of guarantee a, long, a life, an afterlife beyond uh, your, own, uh, your own scope. Uh, and then fostering again the discussion on the fair principle, you know, the, the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability of the resources that we build and we share on the web. It's also essential in order to uh, continue growing uh, uh, ethically, especially for what concerns digital resources. Um, so in, I know I do not have much time, but very briefly, one of the platforms that as a center we developed it's a digital journal called uh, Magazine, of which I'm co curator and journal manager. So, Magazine, International Journal for Digital and Public Humanities, is uh, based uh, uh, at the VDP in Venice, at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities, and it's an open platform for theoretical debates, methodological reactions, and analysis of case studies ranging from philology to history to art history and cultural heritage and the glam sector. Uh, the name refers to the historical definition of public houses in the Republic of Venice, which were places of uh, diverse human deeds and thriving, including information exchange, commercial bargains and poem brokerage. The journal aspires to constitute an open platform for a wide range of disciplinary fields and methodological approaches sharing the scholarly potential of a digital and public discourse. We're now coming at that, well, we published the fourth issue on consolidation comes with practice, and we're working on the fifth uh, um, issue of uh, 2022. Um, methodologically speaking, we are very open because we understand that this uh, is a growing field and there are always new inputs uh, and uh, uh, new uh, issues that arise uh, specifically uh, dealing with uh, individual projects. Um, but we are, um, again, uh, witnessing uh, that the discussion is going uh, uh, more and more uh, towards uh, a globally operating community in this varied domain. 
and uh, demonstrates a scientific self-awareness uh, in terms of uh, um, making an, the digital humanities an established sector. Um, so these are my two cents. I hope they were uh, useful for you and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was a, a really an insightful presentation. And especially I would I really liked your advice to, you know, to focus on interdisciplinarity and, you know, keep uh, our research groups really interdisciplinary. I think this is exactly what we've done today, <laughs> uh, trying to apply a lot of knowledge that we collect and, uh, collected from digital diplomacy and from uh, uh, media and communication studies. And and from international relations to apply it to the field of glam sector as i mentioned in the very beginning of the conversation this topic is a very very new and not so much discussion happening and i'm very glad that we together today started this uh, conversation so I, I i would love to you know to challenge you with a few questions but i think we run out of time our participants are slowing going away from uh, their zoom webinar i think it's really high time to stop here but i would like to invite all audiences to send the questions that they have to us and i will be happy to share them with you all the panelists uh, today on, on in the discussion forum so you can follow up with them directly thank you very much for all your inputs uh, it was really uh, an amazing event i enjoyed every second and um, uh, please come this wednesday for our data phone to continue this conversation Conversation about digital audiences and how we could better understand our digital audiences, how we could map them. And uh, please come in our uh, next online session that will happen in the end of May. So thank you and come back.